Uh, Church, would you join me in in Matthew chapter 20? It'll come up on the screen. Um, I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. We're continuing our series, uh, The Parables of Jesus, um, this morning on the parable of the vineyard workers, again, found in Matthew chapter 20. But would you stand with me as as we take a posture of, of, yeah, turning our affection, our attention towards towards the word of, of God? Jesus is speaking, and he says this, For the kingdom of heaven is like the landowner who went out early one morning to hire workers for his vineyard. He agreed to pay the normal daily wage, and he sent them out to work. At 9 o'clock in the morning, he was passing through the marketplace, and he saw some people standing around doing nothing. So he hired them, telling them he would pay them whatever was right at the end of the day. So they went to work at the vineyard at noon, and again at 3 o'clock, He did the same thing at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. He was in town again, and he saw some more people standing around. He asked them, why haven't you been working today? They replied, because no one hired us. So the landowner told them, then go out and join the others in my vineyard. That evening, he told the foreman to call the workers in and pay them, beginning with the last workers first. When those hired at 5 o'clock in the afternoon were paid each received a full day's wage. When those hired first came to get their pay, they assumed they would receive more. But they too were paid a day's wage. When they received their pay, they protested to the owner. Those people worked only one hour, and yet you paid them just as much as you paid us, who worked all day in the scorching heat. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair. Didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then, and those who are first will be last. Jesus, thank you that you disrupt our status quo. Thank you that you are wise, and that you are good, and that you are subversive, and you teach us, and you teach us to live a life that is seen from your perspective and your grace and your righteousness and your generosity and not from the perspective of our works. You're good to us. It teaches again what it is to trust in you, to trust that in your vineyard we will be cared for. And so we say that in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Please feel free to have a seat. I'm, I'm in the process of uh, selecting a favorite soccer team. I, 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 a, a group of friends of mine are um, apparently avid Premier League English uh, soccer fans. And they've asked me to join them in, in fantasy soccer, and I have no idea what I'm doing, but I'm winning after week one. Yeah. Um, but as, I, as I'm getting into English soccer, and as I'm trying to decide who will be my team, I'm doing so with, with this in mind. Teams and fan bases have culture. Teams and fan bases have culture. I, I actually went and uh, a couple of weeks ago, as, this, as the season was about to start, I went out and I actually Googled which Premier League team has the most annoying fans. <laughs> and the list came up. Like, obviously, like Reddit had a thread, and, and, and Yahoo had a thread, and it was like, here's who's historically the most annoying fan bases. And I, hey, listen, I recognize this. I'm saying this. I'm talking about fan bases as a Dodger fan. I confess that. I recognize the irony of talking about fan bases and arrogance and, and pride and, and being spoiled, right? Like, I, 
I acknowledge the irony. But I'm looking over, I have a fresh chance. I have a fresh start now with the Premier League soccer team. And I'm trying to figure out like who, which culture do I want to be a part of? And I actually went through the same process not too long ago as I started watching a little bit more NBA. And I watched and I saw Steph Curry on the court. And I saw the way that he played. And I saw the way that, that he was described as being someone that was so selfless. The way that he moved without the ball. The way that it, everyone described that, that Steph Curry plays with a level of joy. And he won me over. It was this level of like just watching him play and just going, that's, that's who I want to root for. That's the culture that I want to be a part of. That's, that's what I want to cheer on. Why do I say all that? Because as we talk about parables this morning, what I want to make sure that we bring to the table is that you know, you'll notice in a whole lot of Jesus' parables, he'll start off the parables by saying this, for the kingdom of heaven is like. For the kingdom of heaven is like. And actually what you'll notice is, is that he doesn't say something to the effect of, let me tell you a story of what God is like. What he's doing is he's introducing us to culture. This is what my kingdom is like. And, and the parables are, are described as meant to be provoking crisis in the ears of the hearers. And what I mean by that is, is that what, what parables do is that we, we listen to the parables, there's usually this shock or a twist kind of a moment or a question that's being asked. And as the listeners, we've got to make a decision. Do I want to be a part of that culture? Do I want in on that? Maybe we'll go to Eugene Peterson, and this is something that he points out as he looks at the, at the parables of Jesus. He said it this way. He said, Jesus frequently reinforced the centrality of hospitality by telling parables that featured food and drink, meals and banquets. He was training the imaginations of his listeners, it includes us, to see salvation being worked out, not being earned, being worked out, to being lived out in a foreigner, a neighbor's midnight demand for bread, a beggar at a rich man's door, right? The parables become a training ground. They become an introduction to us. They become this place of saying, listen, not, this is what God is like. This is what his kingdom is like. Do you want in? Do you want to be a part of this? Do you want to join in on this? See, the parables are this place of saying, listen, Jesus is inviting us and saying, I want you to be on board with the kingdom of heaven being like this, but not only just being on board with it and saying, yes, amen, God, you are like that, but it's this invitation to say, do you want to be a partner? Do you want to be a participant? Because this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. And I'm inviting you to be a citizen of this kingdom. I'm inviting you to be a participant in this kingdom. I'm inviting you to be a partner in what my kingdom is like. And so let's talk specifically about this parable of the vineyard workers. You'll look, you'll look at this shock kind of moment, right, where, where, where those that were hired at 6 a.m. are paid the same amount as those that were hired at 5 p.m. And as you look closely at the words of the landowner, you will see that Jesus is introducing us to a culture. What is the kingdom of heaven like? Listen to the words of the, of the vineyard owner, of the landowner. He answered one of them, friend, I haven't been unfair didn't you agree to work all day for the usual wage? Take your money and go. I wanted to pay this last worker the same as you. Is it against the law for me to do what I want with my money? Should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? And what Jesus is introducing to us is the culture of the kingdom. And, what he, and there, I think there are, three, there are three dynamics that I think Jesus wants us to pay attention to as, as he gives us this parable. He wants us to pay attention to his righteousness. I think he wants us to pay attention to his free will. And I think that he's getting us to pay attention to his appraisal. How does he evaluate things? Let's talk about that first one, his righteousness. The, the landowner responds to those that have worked since 6 a.m., friend, I haven't been unfair. And honestly, we, we probably looked through this parable, and we might argue to the landowner, 
no, you've been unfair. <laughs> actually, I, I think that in our society that, that we actually might have a legal case if we were to take this landowner to the courts. I, I think that we actually might win. I think that we might be able to come to the judge and say, okay, this person that worked one hour, they got paid a full day's wage, and then when, it, when I looked at my paycheck, I'm noticing, like, I did 12 times or 11 times as much work as they did. I don't know how the math plays out exactly, but I did more. I picked more grapes. And we're being paid the same amount. I think what Jesus is doing here in the story is that he's, 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 he's provoking our, our imagination and our understanding. Because I think that what we often, the way that we understand the world and the way that we understand our relationship with God, the trap that we sometimes fall into, is this. If I work harder than others, then I should be paid more. Uh, I, we could press further into that. I think that, that sometimes what we conclude is God is good depending on what I get versus what others get. And what, the trap we really fall, fall into is that we look at our work in comparison to others' work and we connect that to how God should treat us. And what Jesus is doing in this parable is that he's light, highlighting something about our hearts. We're good with generosity. We say yes to generosity. We say yes to grace. We say yes. Yeah, God, be, be generous, but we want merit-based generosity. <laughs> Right, right, because I think the way that our minds work is we're, we're the 6 a.m. worker. We're, we're there. We're toiling throughout the day. We, we've, we've lived this faithful life to Jesus. And, 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 and you could see the gears turning as Jesus tells the story of the workers that showed up at 6 a.m. They sit there. They watch as the foreman dishes out pay to those that have only worked one hour. And what do they immediately start doing? Right? You can imagine it. They start creating a scale. They start creating an algorithm for generosity. Well, if they worked for one hour, and I worked for 12 hours, and they got a full day's wage, I should get 12 days' wages. Look. Right? Like, it's this point. Like, they probably saw the, the, the generosity of the landowner. They probably saw that very first gift being given out or that very first pay check being, being given. And, and the, the response is by very likely, like, whoa! Look! Look at how gracious the landowner is to the 11th hour employee. That means I will receive an equal percentage of generosity. <clears throat> But friends, that's not how generosity works. That's not how grace works. So here's the statement of the landowner. I haven't been unfair. Because I paid you what we agreed on. And what his statement tells us is this. His righteousness, his goodness, his fairness is found in his faithfulness, not to us comparing what we have to what others have. The statement from the vineyard owner, from the landowner, is I'll, in this vineyard, in this culture, you'll be taken care of. In, 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 in this culture, you won't be shortchanged. It's a statement that, 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 
that, that we're discovering about the attribute of God is that he is, he is good. And he is good because he's good, not because we're good. Right? It's, it's this understanding that he's, he, he wants us to agree with. To, to live life from a perspective of. Like, like he, he, God, will always be good. He will always be right. He will always be just. He will always be fair. He will always be holy. He will always be, he will always be perfect. He will always measure up to himself. But we cannot evaluate that based on what others have. He is good because he is good. And it is, it is, it is his, his character, his nature of being righteous is not determined by our goodness. He will be who he is. But Jesus tells this parable to let us know, right? Like, here's, here's the culture. Here's, here's the understanding. You can say no to this. You, you, your response can be to tell this landowner, no, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll take the merit-based generosity. Thank you very much. Like, I'd, I'd rather operate from a perspective that says I, I want to evaluate what others have based on who they are and how good they are, and I want to compare that to what I have and how good I have acted. And the truth is, is that we regularly fall into that temptation where we evaluate the world on, on is, the, is God's creation good and fair because those that, are, that act worse than me, do they have less than me or more than me? And if they have more than me, then life is not fair. And if they have less than me, then life is fair. And we start evaluating, God, you are good dependent upon this algorithm that I'm creating based on my righteousness, not based on your righteousness. To this, Robert Capone comments in his commentary on the parables, the only bruised backsides belong to those who insist on butting themselves into outer darkness. You could say no to this agreement. Right? The, the, the response of the landowner is, is if you want to demand this, this merit-based generosity, you have the option. You could take your money and go. You can opt in to this culture or not. All right, listen, cue, cue, cue the words of Jesus in, in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells us, for you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. He's letting us know in the statement, like, do you want me to be someone who judges based on works? Is, is that the posture that you want to take in this world? Do you want to be the one that's going out and start evaluating what people should get and shouldn't get? We can go that way. <laughs> It's not going to be as great as you think it is. It's not going to work out to how you think it should work out. And I think Jesus tells this parable to, 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 to ask us a question that we should genuinely wrestle with. Am I good to you? Am I good to you? But don't base your answer on what you have versus what others have. Don't base your response on they have more and I have less. We went through a season, we went through a season, a year, two years, three years, like we went through a pretty long season here as a community where, where there was pastoral transition, there was COVID, there, there was just a lot that we walked through. And can I tell you, 
that through that season, I really had to wrestle with the goodness of God. Because I would open up Instagram and I would open up Facebook and I would see these reels of thriving churches, of growth, of flourishing, of baptisms. And I would be in this room on my own late at night going, are you good? Because I was basing his goodness on what do those other churches have? And I got broke down where I had to conclude, are you good based on how you treat me? Not looking at what I perceive other people have. I had to learn. Because I sat. I sat in pastoral gatherings. I sat in backyards where pastors got together and talked about like the state of their communities. And it would start off with one person. They're like, oh, God is so good. Like, yeah, it's been COVID, but man, we doubled in size. And we would go to the next person. Yeah, man, oh, it's been such, it's been such a good, God has been so good to us. Like, man, we've, we had like 15 baptisms at the beach this past Sunday and someone else would go. And as they're all sharing, I'm just sitting there getting more and more frustrated and getting more and more ashamed and feeling in this posture, just like, it's going to be my turn soon. <laughs> and what do I say in that moment? And when it comes around to me, do I just be like, yep, God is good. And I just had to learn to respond in that face of saying, Whatever it might look like in ministry to have a Midas touch, I have the opposite of that. <laughs> I just like, it just feels like everything that we do, it just gets frustrated, and I have no idea what I'm doing, and I'm failing, and, and everyone's leaving, and, and, and in that space, trying to discern is God still righteous? Is he still holy? Is he still perfect? Is he still blameless? Is he still fair? And I had to get to the place of concluding it's, it's like how Theodore Roosevelt famously said, comparison is the thief of joy. And you will miss out on the joy of the kingdom if you start defining God's righteousness based on what others have. The question being asked to the 6 a.m. workers is, will you agree to this system? where I will honor my word. Where I will be able to express generosity where it won't make sense to you, but you can be assured. I will be good to you. But the culture is, if you go around and start comparing what you have versus what others have, you're gonna be miserable. <laughs> It's going to be difficult. Let's talk about the next one. Let's talk about his free will. <laughs> the, the landowner tells the 6 a.m. workers, I wanted to. That's why I wanted to. <laughs> Friends, God can do what he wants. God, God has free will. God is sovereign. God has the ability to do what he wants. The fun, the fun of the parable is what is revealed to us about what God enjoys doing. What God wants to do is be lavish. 
What God enjoys doing is being gracious. What God loves to do is be compassionate. Paul captures it another way in Ephesians chapter 1, and he shouts out to us what God enjoys doing. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, it says it this way. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do, and it gave him great pleasure. As you listen to Jesus tell this parable, you can start imagining the landowner as he's walking around in the marketplace and you just see his gears turning. You see how his mind works and Jesus is cluing us in to the nature of God as he tells this parable. What, what is happening? What is happening in the imagination of God? What is the way that God is processing? He's walking. It's like God is like walking through a marketplace and just going... I want to hire them. <laughs> There's an hour left in the work. This will be funny. This will be fun. This will, it, 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 it's just going to be hilarious. It's just, it's just like you can imagine the landowner walking around and just having just like this aha kind of moment. You know what would be great right now? If I hired this person for one hour and I paid them for 12. That'll be hilarious. That's what I want to do. It's, it's, it's this belly laughter, and it's this divine prank on human pride and hierarchy. You know what would be fun? <laughs> if I make the last first. <laughs> you know what would be fun? <laughs> if those that have least, I give them the most. You know what would be hilarious? Watch this. You know what would be fun? If those were, that were lost get the same amount. What does God choose to do with his free will? Be generous. Be joyful. There was this moment in high school. I was, I was sitting in the passenger seat of, of, of the car as my friend Blake is driving. We're driving through La Habra, and, and as, we, as we are, he, he looks over at me, and he has this grin. He has this mischievous grin on his face, and he looks over at me, and he says, Hey, Vince, watch this. I have no idea what's going on. He doesn't clue me in at all. He just says, come on, we're going. I don't have a choice because I'm in the passenger seat, right? Like, I opted into the car, so I have to go along with it. And so he pulls in the Krispy Kreme, and he, he goes in through, he's going through the drive-thru. He, he interacts with the person over the intercom, and they ask, you know, welcome to Krispy Kreme. What would you like? And he said, I would want one donut. And they said, okay, you have one donut. And as, as we, we he's, he still has this just grin upon his face, and as we're pulling up to the window, he, he hands, they, so they say that'll be, I think it was 75 cents at the time. He says, that'll be 75 cents. And he hands them a dollar, and he just yells out, ha ha, sucker! And he takes off <laughs> without his donut. And the person, I remember looking back, and the person that was in the drive through window, they're holding a dollar and they're holding a donut, and they look and they're just like, what in the world just happened right now? For him, it was just this, for him, it was the most hilarious prank. Like, watch what happens in this moment. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to order a donut, I'm going to give a person a dollar, and I'm going to go away without my donut. And they're going to have to figure out, what in the world do I do with this dollar? Heaven is fun. The kingdom of heaven, what's it like? Friends, someone called this passage the parable of the eccentric owner. Why? Can you imagine? Can you imagine if you were the accountant? Can you imagine if you were the bookkeeper for this vineyard owner? Oh, wait, wait, hold up, hold up. You did what? No, I, was, I, was, I was in the marketplace. I was in the marketplace. It was 3 p.m. I was walking around, and some people were over there, and I was just like, hey, do you have anything to do? And they are like, no, we're just here. And he said, do you want to go work? And they said, sure. And so I paid him for the whole day. You did what? 
No, 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 it gets better, it gets better. Trust me, go along with it. Come on, keep on, let's just, let's just keep talking about it. It's fine, it's fine, let's talk about the books. Like, like then, I, then later on, I was out in the vineyard, I was out in the marketplace, and, and it was, I was like, ah, oh, there's, like, there's like an hour or 15 minutes left, and there were some people that were off to the side, and I went up to them, and we just started a conversation, and there was like, why didn't you work today? What are you doing in the marketplace? And they're sitting there, and they're like just looking at the bread, and there's like, you just see the, the hunger that's on their face, and I just started laughing to myself, and I was like, you know what would be hilarious right now? If I hired them. That would be fun. And so I told them, do you want to go work? And they said yes. And so they went into the vineyard. And so, you know, an hour later, I told the vineyard, I told our, the, I told Bob, the, the, the foreman, like, hey, you know, you know what? Here. Here's a fool's day wage for those that worked an hour. It was the best. <laughs> It was amazing. And so Jesus tells this parable, and she's like, this is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Like, if you have a problem, if you have a problem with people working for one hour and getting a full day's wages, if you have a problem with that, you're not going to like the kingdom. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. Let me, let, me, let me just, and you start walking through all these things that Jesus does. Let me tell you, let me tell you about about who we are, like, like there was this moment where this woman came into the room and, and she had this, this jar of, of, of perfume and what she decided to do with it, rather than like selling it and creating this investment fund that might, that might fuel a year of nonprofit work, what she just decided to do was just like, I'm gonna worship Jesus with this and she just poured it all out. Isn't that amazing? Like if you have a problem with that, you're gonna have a problem with the kingdom. There's this moment when Jesus is sitting in the temple courts. He's sitting, and maybe it was in the synagogue, and he's looking there, and he's seeing all the rich people come in, and they're giving their offerings, and they're just like, like here's here's a thousand dollars towards the towards the worship center bathroom fund, and just like they gave so much money. It's, but then there was this widow that came in, and she had like she had this like like a penny, and she gave it, right? And it's just like, like in that moment, Jesus responded and said. She's given more than anybody else. And if you have a problem with that valuation system, you're going to have a problem with the kingdom of heaven. There are these friends. And what they decided to do, some people argue that it was actually the house of Jesus. That what they decided to do was to start ripping apart the roof of Jesus' home so that they could lower their crippled friend down through that roof. And you know what Jesus did? He didn't look up and say, like, you ruined my roof. He looked down at the man, paying no attention to the hole. To today, your sins are forgiven. And if you have a problem with Jesus giving more value to this man, and, and acknowledging the faith of his friends, if you have a problem with them doing that while ripping apart the property of Jesus, you're going to have a problem with the kingdom of heaven. This is what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's, the heads, it's like Jesus coming up to you and just like, hey, watch this. Do you want to join me in this? Do you want to participate with me in this? I'm going to make the least first. I, I'm going to make the lost found. And you're going to see this on display in a radical way when, when a man who is, sit, who, is, who, is, who is on a cross, who is just cursing me out, for 99% of his life, he lived as a criminal, as a sinner. He's going to turn to me, and he's going to say, remember me. And I'm going to say, you get all of eternity with me. Because that's what I want to do. The way that Jesus acts, the way that we see Jesus living throughout the gospel accounts, it's holy, it's wise, it's beautiful, it's just, it's subversive, there's a plan, there's a purpose, but it's also just plain old fun. 
He's having a blast. This is what he wanted to do. And it will give him great pleasure. Do you want to participate in this kingdom? Do you want to be a part of this culture? What Jesus is doing is, is, is it, as he's doing this, we learn from him. We learn what he's up to. It's this point in which he's, he's saying, like, I'm, I'm going to raise up a people who start treating one another differently. I am going to create a community that regards each other with love. I'm going to bring together a diverse group of people, or people who used to have animosity with one another, and they start understanding each other to be equal, a people that just go out in the world and just love each other because they've learned the playful generosity of their God, and they realize we're not in competition with one another. We could just have the fun of being generous with our God. There are these moments that, I, that my family will decide, hey, let's play Monopoly together, or let's play a board game together, or let's play you know, whatever games together. And there's some times where I just say, no, I don't, I don't want to right now. And then they start playing together, and I see the fun that they're having. And in that moment, I am won over. And I just say, can I get in on the next round? I, you know what? Actually, I do want to play Snakes and Ladders. That looks like a blast. And what Jesus is, is doing is I believe he's winning us over with his play. Do you see the fun that he's having as he heals that lame man? Do you see the joy that he has as, as he sits at a table with tax collectors and prostitutes? Do you, do you see the fun he's having as he goes over to Zacchaeus' house? There's this way that Paul phrases it in the book of Galatians. He says, for you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters. But don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. What God is up to is recognizing you've been set free. You've been set free from, from this 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 allegiance that you've given over to, to sin. And as I set you free from that, what are you going to do with your freedom now? What you could do is get in on the fun. What you could do with your free will is get in on the generosity of the kingdom. Let's talk about his appraisal. The, the landowner responds to those that worked at 6 a.m. and he asks them, should you be jealous because I'm kind to others? So those who are last now will be first then and those who are first will be last. Now what I want to do is actually to talk about this one, I want to talk about what's happening in the passage before this. I'll summarize it for us, but then I'll read a little bit of the ending of, of Matthew chapter 19. A rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and, and the question from the rich young ruler is, what do, and like phrases it this way, what do I have to do, what good works do I have to do to have eternal life? And Jesus goes on, and he interacts with them, you know, hey, here's the greatest commandments, love the Lord your God, uh, keep all the commandments, and the young man responds, like, yeah, I've done all those things. And so Jesus responds, hey, one thing that you're lacking, like take all your, take everything that you have and sell it. And we're told that the response of this rich young ruler is that he went away sad because he had a lot of possessions. And Jesus responds and he says, I tell you how difficult it is for a rich man to enter into heaven. It's more difficult uh, than, than for a camel go, than go to the eye of a needle, right? Jesus is saying, like, it's, it's so difficult. Why? Why? Because what Jesus is highlighting for us is that, that this rich young ruler has created a valuation system. 
He's created an appraisal system, right? And he's got to decide here in this moment. What Jesus is doing as he's interacting with him is to highlight, like, listen, what do you consider more worth, uh, worthwhile? What do you consider a greater treasure, all of your possessions or the kingdom of heaven? Which one do you want? And so here's what I'll read happens next. Actually, let me, let me, what, what, Peter, what happens next is that then Peter sees all this take place, and in typical Peter fashion, he looks up at Jesus and he says to, to Jesus, hey, we've given up everything. And he literally says this, what do we get? <laughs> like, almost like he didn't hear, didn't really pay attention to the interaction, right? Jesus is telling this rich young ruler, like, hey, if you give up everything, then you'll have eternal life. But what Jesus is, is, is trying to get across to the man is you're kind of deciding you don't want eternal life because you consider your stuff more important. And so Peter responds in a way that just is like, okay, but we gave up everything. What stuff do we get? And so to this, to this, Jesus responds he says, his, his answer to Peter is so beautiful. I assure you that when the world is made new, the Son of Man sits upon his glorious throne. You who have been my followers will also sit on the 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. But he expands and he says, everyone, everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will inherit eternal life. But many who are the greatest now will be the least important then. Do you hear this? This is how he concluded the parable. It's almost like he's making a connection here. And those who seem least important now will be greatest then. What he's getting across to Peter is you can't buy heaven. That's not what's happening here by you giving up everything. Everyone who gives up for my sake will receive I'll take care of them. In this vineyard, people are taken care of. But he goes further. They'll receive a hundred times as much. And it's to highlight what Jesus is doing in this parable. It's to highlight this is not a fair exchange. That's what this is. This, is, this has never been about a fair exchange. You, you can never work enough hours to earn what I'm dishing out. It's not possible. And, and so because it can never be considered fair, this exchange that we're into, it doesn't matter how much you've given up compared to what others have given up. And let me go a little bit further than that. It doesn't matter how long you have worked compared to how long others have worked. You work for one hour, this is not a fair exchange. You work for 12 hours, this is not a fair exchange. You're not buying your way in. You're not doing to get. There's, there's, no, there's no appraisal of our work that can make sense. There's no valuation system that we can establish. There's no algorithm that we can create. There's no way that we can start, but, but so often we do. So often we create these systems in our mind that say, if I pray, God, I prayed so much, you should give me this. And so often we fall into this trap that says, but I led a Bible study, but I did this, and I'm living faithfully, and I've been good, and I have given more than 10%, and I have, and I have, and I have, so why aren't you? And so Jesus tells this parable, it's just like, no, you're missing the point. It's not about if you do this, then I do this. I am good. Bank on that. You don't want this to be about a system of what you do in order to get. But how often we, 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 we take this posture in our spirituality and our understanding of God that says, I did, so why aren't you? What do I get? What do I get? Should you be jealous, right? That's the question of, of the landowner. It's this question that, that, that is meant to just mess with us. Should you be jealous that others who do less work than you get the same amount as you? Should you be threatened by what other people have? 
And, and maybe from this angle, should you be insecure about what you have to offer? Because if it's a merit-based system, that's why we feel insecure in saying, God, I don't have as much to bring to the table. I'm not as talented, I'm not as eloquent, I'm not as gifted, I'm not as charismatic, I'm not as smart, I'm not as, whatever it may be. I can't. And so because we've created this merit-based kind of generosity, we think that if I could bring more to the table, then I'm going to see God's faithfulness in a greater degree. That is not how it works. It is not about what you can bring to the table that then somehow equates to the goodness of God that you will see expressed to you in your life. I love the way that, that Craig Bloomberg, he actually quotes somebody else, but in the book Interpreting the Parables, he he's, writes it out this way. He's talking about McKenzie, another uh, commentator. He says, McKenzie argues that the parable is about equal honor to all who labor in the kingdom vineyard, explaining that God honors our honest, godly labor, but we are not reducible to our, our proxy productivity or our years of service. Again, we do not need to compare the value of our gifts and our contributions to those of others. We do not need to begrudge God's invitation to another or to feel that our efforts are not valuable because they are not as obvious, as dramatic, and as long-standing as those of others. Because we so often conclude, like, if I can, if I can bring more gifts... Then, then somehow, like there's going to be a better valuation system here. This is response that Peter gives as he responds to the, like the rich young ruler. He didn't want to give up everything. I gave up everything. What do I get? And, Peter, and Jesus' response is, is to him, but is also to all of us, right? It's this place of understanding. Peter, in my vineyard, everyone receives. And what they receive will be a hundred times. And you think that would be that, right? You think that, that this interaction with Peter would take place and that Jesus would tell this parable and the disciples would all conclude, oh, we get it now. We get it. We understand. We can trust you. We don't have to maneuver. We're not in competition with one another. We could just join you in being generous to others. We could celebrate how other people are succeeding. We could, we could be totally fine with where other people are sitting at the table. Like, are they close to you? Are they farther away? I remember yesterday, like, I was at the very end of the table when you were at the other side. Ah, it's okay now. Like, I get it, Jesus. Like, you're, it's okay. We're all taken care of and we're all sitting at the table together. And that's not what takes place, is it? Because in the very next story, after this interaction, right? Jesus has this interaction with the rich young ruler. You can't buy heaven. Don't try to become more significant. Don't try to become more prominent. Like, just play along with the generosity of, of the landowner. As Jesus was going up to Jerusalem. He took the 12 disciples aside privately and told them what was going to happen to him. He said, listen... We're going up to Jerusalem where the Son of Man will be betrayed to the leading priests and the teachers of the religious law. They will sentence him to die. Then he will hand him over to the Romans to be mocked, to be flogged with a whip, and to be crucified. But on the third day, he will be raised from the dead. Right? Jesus very clearly like laying out. Like, hey, listen, it's not about what you can give. As a matter of fact, let me tell you about how I'm going to give. Let me tell you about how I'm going to sacrifice. This, this is how you're going to receive. It's going to be based on my righteousness, not yours. You can't earn. You can't buy. There's no algorithm. There's the, the appraisal system. It would never make sense in your mind. Like, it, it's not about what others have versus what you have. Like, I'm literally going to die for you. The very next verse. Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons, she knelt respectfully to ask a favor. What is your request? He asked. She replied, In your kingdom, please let my two sons sit in the places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. 
But Jesus answered by saying to them, you don't know what you're asking for. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I'm about to drink? Oh, yes, they replied. We're able. Jesus told them, you will indeed drink from my bitter cup, but I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. My father has prepared those places for the ones he has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard that James and John had asked what they, uh, what ha they had asked about, they were indignant. But Jesus called them all back together. Come on, guys, huddle back up. <laughs> Let's talk about this again. I think you're missing the point. <laughs> and he said, you know that the rulers in this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it'll be different. Whoever wants to be a leader amongst you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must become your slave. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the culture. Serve. Here's the culture. Bless. You do not have to maneuver into places of honor and significance in this vineyard. You don't have to compare. Celebrate. Celebrate. Join him in how he rewards others. Join him as he celebrates others. Join him in how he values and puts the spotlight on others. Smile alongside him as, as the radiance of his face shines upon other people. In this vineyard, you can afford to be generous. In this vineyard, you can afford to serve others because heaven's unfair and heaven is fun. And God doesn't seem to care that you are not able to earn what he's paying. There's abundance. The landowner's rich. Jealousy doesn't make sense. So you might as well get in on the fun. Would you stand with me? I want to read a little um, liturgy that Loris and I came across when on vacation we were visiting another um, church community and I just really loved this posture that they took as a community because I think it just highlights like this is, this is who we are. This is who we are as a people. Would you, would you be willing to read this out loud with me? We'll start, we'll actually read it out loud together. Here we go. Holy Father, there is nothing we have that you have not given us. All we have and are belong to you, bought with the blood of Jesus, to spend everything on ourselves and to give without sacrifice is the way of the world that you cannot abide. But generosity is the way of those who call Christ their Lord, who love him with free hearts and serve him with renewed minds who withstand the delusion of riches that chokes the word, whose hearts are in your kingdom and not in the systems of this world. We are determined to increase in generosity until it can be said that there is no needy person among us. We are determined to be trustworthy with such a little thing as money that you may trust us with true riches. Above all, we are determined to be generous because you, Father, are generous. It is the delight of your daughters and sons to share your traits and to show what you are like to all the world. Amen.